and you have uh, Conyers and Macaulay. They go forward, but this time you brought up those veteran infantry. Here's another thing that Marion's guys can't stand against, bayonets. 64th comes forward with their bayonets. Marion, remember, one of the rules that he has, one of the principles of war for partisan warfare is, hey, you don't get in a fight that you're not going to win outright. So Marion calls for retreat. So when he calls out retreat, he and his men move down the road. Watson and his guys dust themselves off and continue to march. Oh, by the way, uh, Henry Nace with the King's American Regiment, he was there. That was before they went to Camden. And he said, at 11 o'clock, we had a skirmish with Mr. Marion and his gang of robbers. Uh, and it just gave no love at all to uh, Francis Marion and his guys. Uh, British had at least three killed, American six killed, 12 wounded. This is what a three-pounder looks like. These are my buddies uh, Don Taylor and Tom O'Black over at uh, Historic Camden. Oh, by the way, if you want a cannon, we can hook you up. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> hey, these cannons, they're about uh, 206 pounds just to tube itself. All together, a little bit over 400 pounds. So four men could lift this thing and carry it for the most part anywhere you wanted to. It was highly mobile. And those little, uh, to move it around, you had those uh, little post at the end there and when it would fire it would kick up on those and that's why they call it the uh, grasshopper okay it would, could fire cannonballs cannonballs you usually only use those against uh, uh, the fortifications buildings that sort of thing uh, but for personnel you use canister and grape shot and that's what grape shot and canister look like basically big shotguns these were big balls over here uh, would uh, definitely tear people up. Next stop for Watson is Canning Plantation. That's the uh, plantation of John Canning. Now I will tell you, Francis Barry and his men stayed there several times during, uh, uh, during his operations just north of the Santee. Uh, Canning was a brother of Mary Canning, who was Thomas Sumter's wife. Next stop was Mount Hope Swamp. This is what Mount Hope Swamp looks like. This is a photo courtesy of Jack Parker. What can you do in a place like this? For Marion and his guys, he left uh, Colonel Hugo Reed and they did a delaying action. All you're trying to do is buy time. It gives your folks the ability to get away. It causes problems for the enemy and that you, you make them stop, deploy, and you halt their progress momentarily. Work well here. They destroyed the bridge across Mount Hope Swamp, and Hugh Ori and his guys just fired off a few rounds. The next thing that happens, Watson does a rendition of Waibu Swamp. You bring up grape shot with those cannon, you fire a few rounds, Hugh Ori and his guys leave away, and you have delayed them because now the only way to get across here is you have to rebuild the bridge. So they put the bridge back together and continue to march. What happens next is Marion is moving down the Santee River Road. He is going to move it and he's going like he's going to Georgetown. So you got to kind of put yourself in Marion's mind. What was he thinking here? Marion was thinking that he had to go and figure out what Watson was doing. Was Watson after him, or was Watson going somewhere else? Was his mission uh, troop-oriented, or was it terrain-oriented? So that's what we're looking at here. So what happens is Marion pulls back down here. Watson appears to be following, but then he reverses the route, and he makes a beeline for the lower bridge. He doesn't want to go around the upper bridge at uh, King Street because he doesn't want to have to face those long rifles that Marion and his friends, uh, that his men have. So he's going to go to the lower bridge. He's trying to steal a march, get across there, and if he crosses into the river, he's home free, so to speak. So the next thing that happens, Marion sends Major John James 
with 70 men, 30 of them being uh, McCautry's riflemen, and they know in the territory go cross country here and get over to the lower bridge. When they get over to the lower bridge, they uh, take the middle, uh, the middle planks out of the bridge, and then they burn the east side, and then they set up. What then happens is you have uh, you have Watson and his men go. They go to the bridge and they bring those cannon up, and they've got the high ground. Hey, everybody wants the high ground. It works well about 99% of the time, but not today, because the high ground on the this side of the river. Let's go to the next map here. That is very high, very steep if you look at those contour lines. So what happens is the cannon cannot depress enough to be able to engage the troops on the other side of the river. Since they can't do that, they push the artillery forward so to try to angle it down. And when they do that, McCautry's riflemen are having a field day with the artillery crew. The next thing that happens is we think, and oh, by the way, we think the bridge was here, not the modern bridge today. So you got the bridge here. We think they went down and tried to come across where we think the Ford was. That's where the power line is today. I'm told that the river bottom there is rocky and shallow. So we think that's where the Ford was. They were blocked there as well. As a matter of fact, the captain went down, McCautry's rifleman shot him, killed him. The next three guys coming to get his body, they got killed too. Okay, so Watson is now in bad shape and he comes back and he pulls back to here. Here is Witherspoon's plantation. Okay, Witherspoon's plantation, this is where we think it is. It's where uh, the Williamsburg Historical Society has the Thorn Tree House. We think that could be the original Witherspoon's house, and that would also have been where Bannister Tarleton came by in 1780. Anyways, so this is a long lane here. The British are occupying that lane. When the British occupy that, uh, or that house, uh, we've got a guy named Sergeant McDonald. Sergeant McDonald was legend as well. Allegedly, from in a hickory tree, 300 yards down at the end of that lane, he shot Lieutenant Toriano through the knee, who was kicked back in the chair on the porch. <laughs> after, after that, things uh, you just wooded around here. Francis Barry and his men are, are just uh, raising the dickens there with uh, Watson and his folks. So Watson's got to try to get to a better position. So we think they come up here to Blakely's plantation, which they said was about a half mile north. Well, it will have open fields all the way around it. That way, these guys definitely had to make long shots and they couldn't be hiding in the trees and stuff that were very close. Okay, so at this point, we've got Watson's guys. We think that General, this may be General's Island. We kind of lost the history of what was called what back then. But Marion's guys operating on here, and they come up, and day and night, they are harassing Watson's troops. Okay, that's what the Thorn Tree House looks like today. You can see it over at King Street. Okay, so we now go into what's sort of an operational pause. Don't know exactly why we're doing that. Okay, because if you look here, okay, from about the 13th to the 18th, you're at Blakely's plantation. You were there at a, you were there, there at least a day earlier. Why did he stay in one place for so long? Well, part of it was logistics because you're going around, you're trying to get supplies from the local neighborhood or whatever. But my question is, was he expecting to get a message from Doyle or something else? that was a part of the greater campaign. And that might be something that's lost in history right now. So basically it's only conjecture, but it doesn't make sense that he would have stayed in that one position, but he did. Here's the other thing. Marion, if Marion had done his typical guerrilla type action, once he had engaged with Watson, he would have pulled away and be gone. Obviously, he was going to uh, he was going to stop here and keep him from getting across the river. That makes sense. But I think that what we're seeing here with the Bridges campaign is a transition of Marion going to a more conventional type of warfare. If he had just done hit and run and gone away, then Watson would have gone into Williamsburg District. So 
a little bit of change in how Marion is looking at fighting and looking at war. Okay? The next thing that's also is going on is we got a war of words going on with Marion and the, the British command. What happened was Captain Costell, one of Marion's guys, took prisoners over to get exchanged at Georgetown. When he gets over there, they captured Postel because he had quote unquote violated his parole, that he had signed parole papers that he would uh, not fight against the British, but now he was. Okay, so now, is that a violation that they sent him in under a flag of truce? Well, Marion thought so because he sent a letter to Watson and he sent an armed escort with his flag of truce. So Watson said, that's a violation of war too. So it's kind of back and forth. It's sort of like, you know, the, the two kids over in the corner arguing with each other. Okay, so this goes on and it's uh, just, believe it or not, one of the frustrating parts about this from a historical perspective, we have all these letters discussing all this stuff. Marion never did an after action report on any of this, these acts. <coughs> We've got all these letters, but none for the after action about the military action. So. Okay? Eventually, though, what happened, and one thing I will tell you, that eventually it does get a little bit cordial because Watson asked Marion for permission to send his wounded to Charleston, Lieutenant Toriano being one of them, and Lieutenant Toriano went to Charleston and then said that he recovered. Okay, but Marion did give him permission to move his wounded. Okay, logistics and decisions. Okay, Watson has to get to Georgetown. Okay, so he was going to get to Georgetown by being able to steal a march, he hopes. So, we think that what he did is that he buried, he didn't bury his dead, he didn't want, uh, he didn't want Marion to know how many casualties he had, therefore we don't really know how many casualties he had. Uh, two stories, uh, William Dover James says that uh, by legend that he weighted the bodies and, and put them in a quarry. Well, you look around, there is a depression on the map there uh, over near the bridge. That may have been used to get dirt to uh, build the causeway for the new bridge. I don't know. But another legend is, is that there is a, about a 90 degree turn in uh, Black River that's called Robinson's Hole. It's a whirlpool. And the thought is that maybe they weighted those bodies and dropped them down in there. I've heard that divers have gone near the vicinity there and they don't want to go back. Okay, so uh, yeah, that would be a pretty nasty place. Okay, so what happens? We have Watson that's trying to steal a march here. So he is going to go east down the uh, river road, or uh, correction, uh, he's going to go east, paralleling the Black River, and he's going to go across Ox Swamp. The problem is, Marion has taken down the bridges and dropped trees across the road. So now Watson is in a fix. He's approximately 40 miles from Georgetown and 40 miles from Fort Watson. What are you going to do? He takes a hard right at Ox Swamp and he's going to make a beeline through the woods to Georgetown. Now, let me tell you, if you and I went to that same terrain today and we tried to do that, we'd say it's impossible. All the undergrowth and everything that there is, you got to remember back then, South Carolina was pretty much a longleaf pine forest. Tall trees take 125 years to mature. You would have had like wire grass as the undergrowth that was there. And the trees were widely spaced. You would have been able to easily go through there. So that's what Watson does. He goes over land. So what we're talking about is he gets here to Ox Swamp and he's coming about 15 miles over land back to the Santee River Road. And by that night, he gets here to Chauvin, Chauvin's plantation. So when he gets there, it has not been an easy trip. Marion is pushing at his rear. You have got uh, Peter Warree is hitting his flanks in front. So they're engaging most of the time. This is what Peter Orre says. Of course, this is out of Wing's book. We don't know how much uh, romanticized this part has been. The rogues were constantly in a dog trot, except when they stopped to give us a blast, which they did with their whole line. So that's what Peter Orre says. Dog trot. 
Uh, there was one quote where he said, I never saw men's legs move so fast. <laughs> so these guys are, uh, hey, uh, uh, these guys are moving. Uh, remember, they are dismounted folks. That's the only way they can get there, and they're in a hurry. So as they're in a hurry, they get to Chauvin's plantation, and then Watson tries to send a letter to, uh, to Georgetown. This is the way we're kind of able to push to put together some of the dates here. Uh, dated uh, probably the 20th of March. It says, I shall be this afternoon with my corps under my command at Georgetown for very near it. Okay, so by that afternoon, where Chauvin's is, is about 20 miles away from Georgetown. 20 miles is a decent march for most folks in the military back then. So we think that he was, uh, uh, he was there on the 20th, sent that letter. It was sent by a slave, one of Marion's, uh, or some of Marion's scouts caught the slave and killed him and retrieved that letter. That's why we know what it says. Okay, so that brings us to the battle at the Sand Pit. What Marion did is he sent Ori forward. He said, hey, we need a blocking position on the river. So, Ori comes up, Ori's got his cavalry, and you got Lieutenant John Scott here. Okay, and everything says that he was posted about 50 yards on the other side of the ford. Marion's men, or Ori's men, had taken off the bridge planks on this side. Later on, Watson's own uh, letter said, hey, the bridge was a pyramidal bridge. They took off planks on the side that we could not see. Hey, tried to fake them out. Pretty good deal. Okay, but they take the planks off here, but it says 50 yards of the board. We think there was a board there. There's no evidence of it that you can see today, but I'm here to tell you, Everything else indicates that the British knew there was a ford there and that it had been used before. So, as they're coming along here, you have the British moving down in a, in a column of units, probably had an advanced detachment, kind of like a security element that was forward. They come up and they come to the bridge and they check it out and they see that the planks are off. They probably even see that there are some folks on the other side. So. If you use what modern military would do, these guys do something like, <laughs> hey, they give a hand and arm signal, the commander knows what they're doing, and then this happens. They said that the, uh, the, the uh, provincial light infantry went into a tight column, okay, meaning, hey, they are uh, with fixed bayonets, and said that they very quickly I think the plan for Ori and uh, Scott's riflemen, when these guys would muddle around the bridge here, and when they muddled around the bridge, you would engage them at long distance, and when you engage them at long distance, you would be able to inflict casualties on them. You would be the anvil, and then Marion with his hammer would come up and push them right into the river. You would have them between two forces. That was probably the plan. The PLI messed that plan up. They went immediately into a column, and they said that the water was waist deep and they plunged across the floor the ford and began to form on the other side what happens here is lieutenant scott later on in his pigeon statement would say that he and his 32 riflemen near the bridge with orders to fire when the enemy advanced retreated being outflanked well how in the world did he get outflanked I think that, that security element we talked about there, I think they pushed across on the springers of the bridge. They made an appearance on the other side as a security element. And when they made that appearance as a security element, Scott's looking here, these guys coming here with bayonets. It takes 30 seconds or longer to load a rifle. You got one shot and those bayonets are on you. For whatever reason, Lieutenant Scott voted with his feet and went the other way without firing a shot. He falls back here. According to uh, Weems, Peter Ory calls him a poltroon, which is a coward, and then they have to leave. In the meantime, you have Watson has set a cup across here at an open field. He has a field of fire for the three pounder. He has sent one up here to cover the bridge. He puts the 64th across here, and he's got his Rangers in reserve. 
Marion's advance guard comes up. Watson then engages. They fire with the three-pounder. They halt Marion's folks. And then in his own words, Watson says, uh, as they retreated, I saw a small knot of men and decided that we would attack. Taking the, uh, taking the Rangers, about 20 of them, he said, we went into the attack. And these guys started firing at us, and Watson's horse was shot from under him. Well, as he is lying there, uh, kind of probably with one leg pinned under the horse initially, he said that one patriot took a special interest in him and was coming to do him in. But he said that uh, Watson said that he had a black servant, and that black servant always had a fouling piece, and that that servant shot the guy who was trying to get Watson. In the meantime, we talk about people being people. Little SC Rangers here. About 21 men went up, including Watson. About 20 men went back, leaving Watson. <laughs> As a matter of fact, the same the captain of the 64th told them that they were about to ride right over the infantry. He said, if you don't stop, we're going to fire. Okay, so these guys didn't run over them, thank goodness. But uh, uh, apparently Watson was able to get out from under the horse, grab another horse, and retreat back. He sent the 64th forward with bayonets and then held off Marion's approaching men at that point. What happened after that is Watson's men were able to go across the ford. Uh, they loaded two wagon loads of wounded. They said 20 men. As a matter of fact, they talk about the blood tinged uh, dark waters of the sand pit as these wagons went across. And they made their way towards Georgetown. Marion and his men come up here. And when they get there, there's nothing to do. His men are exhausted. Marion and his men sleep there on the sand pit that night. Watson and his men go over toward Georgetown. They're exhausted as well. They don't try to make it to Georgetown that night. They go to Trapier's Plantation. Okay? And there at Trapier's, this is what Watson says about the way that Marion fights. Will not sleep and fight like gentlemen. <laughs> but like savages are eternally firing and whooping around us by night and by day waylaying and popping at us from behind every tree. 